Hi everyone, a quick note before we launch into today's video. Applications for CADA 5 of our IPSA professional training course are now open for start in September 2022. If you feel that you have a calling towards depth psychology or psychotherapy and would like to train professionally under Steve and Pauline Richards in psychosystems analysis, then you are more than welcome to apply. We really look forward to reading your application. Check the link in the description and pinned comment for the application webpage. Thanks everyone. Now, on to the video. Hello Professor, nice to see you again. Uh, hey, nice to see both of you today. <laughs> yes, she's back. I've made it at last. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Writing a book. Yes, yes. Torn from my computer, yeah. They're torn from your computer, right? Yes, okay. Probably a good thing, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Great. So my idea for today was to uh, talk with you all about trauma. I uh, wanted to kind of compare notes again and see. Yeah, that'll be very interesting. Um, I'd I love to hear how you guys work through that. Now, I had a couple of like two main things I wanted to kind of get into. One was theories of how, how we heal from trauma and then kind of going from there to more the, the process uh, of therapy and how it kind of compares around the world with different healing like rituals so that'd be fun to, to, to talk yeah, about it's very interesting to hear your experience i know you've written extensively on this and it'd be very very interesting to hear how you do that that'd be great yeah, yeah well i'd love to get your insights um the way that you have you know your all's model of the psyche and everything i think it would be really fun to, to apply that to to some of this ritual like cross-cultural stuff so um but my first question for you today is um how do you guys um think about healing from trauma like when someone comes in and they've got a lot of trauma symptoms what do you do wow well we yeah. do on, on normal <laughs> <In> one <laughs> sentence or less no, just kidding. Do on normal, normal spectrum, uh, biopsychosocial assessments obviously and um, also concentrate on the rapport element don't we oh yes yeah. yeah yeah so that's a big part of it for you then is oh, yeah. yeah the therapeutic alliance can okay, I, I couldn't agree more of course yeah, that, that's a, hugely important from our perspective because it gives us the ground upon which uh, to do work. Mm. Also, um, most traumas obviously involve some kind of dissociation um, and, and we work with dissociation all the time. That, that, right. That's what we do. Um, and we find that we can section off people from their trauma and experience themselves without it, which is a, a really interesting progression. But of course, sometimes there's a need to have an associative memory of that trauma in order to heal in a more obvious way. Uh, but we can still generate a state where that's not there. In other words, the trauma is not there. And it's a similar way that, that we deal with the more milder addictions is uh, for a person to be put into a state where they are not the person who uses the substance. Mm, interesting. OK. And then the uh, we get the as far as it is possible, get the biology to agree with the suggestion of the psychology that they are not that person as there was a time before they ever touched an addictive uh, substance. So there's a, it, it's basically that. So full spectrum, as we would call it, biopsychosocial assessments, mm -hmm. rapport, and then progressive kinds of healing dissociations and reassociations in broad terms. But the, the, the fine details, context dependent. On yeah, that. right, right. Yeah, I, I think it's true to say that, Steve. To some extent, I think it depends on the, the type of trauma as mm. well, as to whether you feel yourself as a therapist, you can work authentically with that. That's true. Yeah. And sometimes we have um, younger, you know, our students on our courses, younger people who obviously are preparing to become clinicians being understandably and I think rightly so to some extent concerned with that mm. but then the, there's also um, the situation that no one can have experienced everything either as well and it's still possible I think using some of the techniques that Steve's described for a, for a younger person who may not have had any experience of the specific trauma that comes in nonetheless being able to deal with this if they, if they, if they follow that process mm. so um 
it, it's one of those things, I think you still have to feel comfortable with it sufficiently to want to work with that person. I mean, there are, there are just some things that, that will be off limits with respect to our own experience that we can't have experienced directly ourselves. But right. um, I, I personally prefer to have had some experience that in that direction, if I possibly can, but it's not absolutely necessary, is it? No. No, uh, yes, I yeah, agree, but yeah. uh, and of course, by agreeing, I'm saying no. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, that's true. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I, I remember we had someone come by the university a while back, and they were talking about this process. This process called havening. I don't know if you've ever heard of that. Yeah. No, uh, it sounded to me kind of like what you're talking about with the, it's. They get they would kind of get them into a relaxed mental state, which is sort of a quasi hypnotic state, I think, and uh, basically taking the trauma and putting it into a haven oh. mentally, and that's why they call it havening. And it seems to work very quickly and quite effectively. But I've always wondered, you know, like how does a long is there a long lasting effect here? And I'm I'm not sure. I'm not an expert on it, but I was wondering if there was anything you might have heard of that was similar to that, or if it's something you do. Um. Yes, I, I've heard of that yeah. kind of thing on, on the different okay. things. Um, Neurolinguistic programming practitioners would do that kind of thing. For example, uh, NLP is great up to a point and then it runs out. Uh, in, in my view, we're both trained in NLP, so I think we can we can say that. We've used it for over 30 years. So again, I think mm -hmm. a reasonable thing to, to say. The, um, the drawback with that kind of thing is, I think, precisely what you say, that that sometimes it wears off there's something you have to repeat and then there's a dose effect curve yeah. negatively mm -hmm. uh, whereas what we're doing or what we try to do and this, this is um, refined over obviously a long period of time with people that when the unconscious agrees with what you're doing in that special state that it's not an artificial construct mm -hmm. that it feels it's building itself out from within uh, and the way that we do that is with metaphor. We're, we're very careful with metaphors too, because to generate a, a false model that fits the therapist, say a, a false kind of metaphor, but is imposed upon the individual who may be traumatized, they will resist that. Is that this, oh, this, yeah. this is not agreeable to me, basically. Mm. And they will feel that on the inside, it's not agreeable. Mm. But allowing it to come through in, in the way that we endeavor to do that you, you bypass that resistance mm -hmm. and you mm -hmm. build something which then generates itself um so well that's, that's that sounds that sounds very reasonable i mean a general psychodynamic principle is to think about the symptoms or whatever it is even the resistance as an attempt at healing yeah um, it may be maybe misguided or misdirected or whatever it is but it's still trying to get you there and the, the the concerns I had when I heard about that at first was I thought, well, it might seem like it might work for a while, but sooner or later, the psyche, at least in my view, is always trying to integrate everything. And so sooner or later, it's going to hit some part and says, OK, it's time to bring that that trauma back and, and try to reintegrate it again, even though we sort of walled it off temporarily. And suddenly you're hit with all these symptoms and the patient's completely like overwhelmed and they're like, oh, my God, I'm going crazy. And you're like, hold on, slow down. That's not what's going on. But I can see why you might think that, you know, uh, that's a problem. Okay, a, a lot of these uh, schools lack the basic rapport with the unconscious and it's a top down imposition of a structure. Um, and then it's pure suggestion, but without real communication. Yeah. And suggestion to work in the longer term, as you've, you've said, you need to get agreement from within. Yeah. And not from within the ego, but from within that other part of them, which is orchestrating everything. So well, I think it's a real strength of the IPSA approach is that you directly and in, with intent yeah. engage the unconscious, uh, you know, right directly at that level, rather than I think a lot of the psychodynamic schools out there do they they do it, but they do it in a more roundabout way. I mean, I've certainly never addressed the unconscious directly myself. But it's always in the back of my mind, right? And I'm, of course, I'm not averse to the idea. I think it's a great idea. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, but it seems it's, like that's a really strong principle that, that works well if you do it. And if you don't, you're in trouble. Yeah, it, it's like they've they've forgotten how to ask 
nicely. Yeah, basic good yeah. manners, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So when we talk about relational psychoanalysis, uh, I've, I've said this before, I think that it's like, well, what were you doing before you discovered that you should be talking to people properly? In, in other words, you, you're not relating to them. Why? You know, did it not occur to you that you should? <laughs> and um, the Jungians in particular love to reify the unconscious and, and generate all the, these fictional characters populating the unconscious. Mm. And it's like, well, if only you talk to the real unconscious like that, instead of imposing that on it, you will get a very, very quick response back. Uh, and then when it does agree, that is such a magic and transformational moment for everyone mm. that, that you know something real is happening. Well, yeah, and it's, it's, that's why I think Jung talks a, a whole lot about the religious attitude. Because the religious attitude is one of, gra of uh, gratitude and respect and uh, reverence, hum humility, and those are all things that if you approach the unconscious, you'll you'll do pretty well yes. with yeah. those things. And you know whether or not you think that, that you know you can psychologize religion, I guess if you want to, but it, it just seems an interesting coincidence that they both work <laughs> the same way: the gods as well as the unconscious. <laughs> Go figure. Yeah, I, I think a lot of that. I don't know you, Paul, I think a lot of that has to do with um, projection broadly in, insofar as, you know, some believe that we project the unconscious into the environment and then populate the outside world with the contents of the unconscious and call that religion and, and yeah. the gods and, and whatever. But what if, to some extent, there is an element of reality there which is non-ego graspable? Um, and can only be accessed through that process of projection. And at that mm -hmm. point, we get a sympathetic resonance between what is within and what is without. Mm -hmm. and we get the necessary natural mythological process or state present then for healing to occur. Uh, whenever I've worked with religious people, I accept it automatically. Never oh, yeah, before. automatically. There's no question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think resisting that is a, a complete waste of time. Yeah. Yeah. And so if I have someone who's devout uh, Christian, for example, then I'll just mentally open up my New Testament in my head and then try to remember like, the more important pieces and parts and just go right there with them, you know, because there's so many great things about any, you know, any of the religions. Um, you know, I was talking about this the other day with somebody, um, the, the importance of religion. And, and if you look at studies that show that um, like the effect of religion on mental health, it's the, as long as it's non-fundamentalist, uh, it provides a lot of protection against mental illness, suicides, drug addiction, stuff like that. The fundamentalism, not so much, but you know, what are you gonna do about that? Yeah, you, you, you get a lot of um, neurosis from some fundamentalist beliefs and all. Yeah, they, they tend to make it worse with uh, excessive guilt and all or nothing, black and white, you know, all of that stuff. Yeah, you get a lot of sense of uh, persecution, which then has to be projected, but it doesn't work. Then they persecute themselves on the inside and try and reduce that by finding a, a persecutor who is the other in the environment, the non-believers or whatever it might be. And uh, they're in a permanent state of anxiety, a, a lot of those people. Uh, it's, it's mm -hmm. sad. Yeah, or feeling you know uh, unworthy and guilty and all that kind of thing. So that doesn't help, but... Um, so... Do you, do you guys, it sounds like you all don't work with dreams a whole lot, just like if they pop up, but more di direct interactions with characters and whatnot from the imagination in real time, like in vivo. Well, we used to. Kind of like active imagination, but not not exactly the same. Yeah, we, we, well, we have done, obviously, have, yeah. as you say, Steve, yeah. and, and, and sometimes in the past very extensively, I, I, I think progressively we've move more away from them but to be honest with you to some extent we've been influenced by by yourself on that eric because okay. um you know this idea too of um you know the vast majority at least 50 percent of of dreams being instinctive dreams i mean that just just that um idea in and of itself i think transforms the way that you you view dreaming yeah. uh, and just how how useful it can be to you so we we tend to therefore probably just focus on 
those kinds of things rather than just because you know people produce so much material yeah. I mean in the past it, it it wouldn't have been unusual for somebody to come in with certainly for you Steve yeah, like 10 or 20 yeah. dreams and then just yeah. plump yeah. on the table in front of you yeah. and, and yeah. Yeah. just all be interpreted and it's <laughs> a bit crazy at that point so yeah. um we, we've tried to go for, I think if I can put it this way for quality over quantity really yeah and, and to yeah to, to work through those that appear to be particularly significant um otherwise again people will just you know go off into fantasy and uh rumination and then they won't actually derive anything that that is uh that they can directly relate to and then transfer into their everyday lives so that's gradually been the direction we've gone in i think yeah 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 and that's that's really important to point out that um there are some dangers with if you if you tell your patients that you're sometimes they come in knowing because they can like look at my bookshelf and they can say oh you're doing the dreams let me tell you about this dream but yeah. uh, if I you know if I bring it up there's a danger that sometimes they will bombard you with 105 dreams and yeah. Yeah. that's that's a type of resistance in my opinion it's, um, it's a trans yeah. they're trying to throw a smoke screen up so you don't get to anything yeah. serious you know yeah. uh, that's <laughs> plus yeah. They don't recognize a lot of times folks don't recognize how connected dreams are to the external world like they're they're literally depictions of what's going on in your life, but in symbols if you don't understand the language it just seems like a bunch of nonsense and yeah. so it's safe. Yes, and like you say the danger like we were talking about in other videos is getting lost in that in inner world and never connecting into the outside world and that's that's bad right that's. Yeah. You get yeah. lost in there and unfortunately, like you say some uh poorly executed Jungian therapy can get bogged down by that certainly oh, yes. yes and and I believe that for some of them as well they they don't even interpret now no uh, particularly they'll ask people to bring dreams in and then they'll go through the motions you know presenting them and, and then nothing's actually done with them so I'm not exactly sure what they do what's the point yeah what's the you're not doing anything with it no, no. so i wanted to go through um the, the trauma dream progression which you may have run into in my my stuff um i've kind of taken a lot of that from ernest hartman's work and kind of developed it on my own but my my question is and i'll have to present this so that you can get the full picture and as i'm curious to see if you see this happening in the psyche in your sessions over time over multiple sessions so like what i mean is a person who has a severe trauma usually will come in and they'll have dreams of verbatim repeats of the trauma. And then over time, the there's an expansion of scope, like the trauma will then go to something that's happening now. Um, like, like with my war vets, it would go from getting bombed uh, in Iraq or Afghanistan to getting bombed in Walmart or whatever it is, or high school, right? So they're expanding in scope in terms of where and when. So you might get attacked 10 years ago or, or whatever. Then it, as you keep going, it, it seems like the psyche is incorporating more and more things into this gamish of, of trauma events, mm -hmm. as if to try to mix it up and make more sense of it by just throwing in more stuff, right? And so it's like this ongoing process where the, the psyche is constantly trying to contextualize, contextualize, contextualize. Mm -hmm. That's what the, the sense that I get um, from that is, and, and, and at the end of the stage, right, if you get there, you get to kind of an integrated state where the trauma, it, it happened, but it, it's, it's just this one piece of a much larger puzzle. And so it's nowhere near as overwhelming. Um, and of course, if you look at the dream content and, and as a, a depiction of this verbatim retreats of the trauma is it's as if, if you dream hack it, it's as if you're still being traumatized every day over and over again. Well, yeah, that's what it feels like. But then it slowly goes and moves into this other direction. So when I look at this process, I think there's the, the immune system of the psyche is saying, I need to make sense of this by connecting it to everything else that's happened to me in my life so far. That's how I can understand it and make sense of it. So then my question for you after that long preamble is when you're working with folks and their you know, imagination creations and all that sort of thing, does this do the same thing in trauma or does it do something completely different? 
in your experience? Well, I, I think what you've said is extremely intelligent and informative, and I, I can certainly see how the dream process, the dream work, as Freud might have called it, would have would work out that way when it's done by an expert practitioner like yourself. Right. I think it would take somebody with your background and your knowledge to be able to handle that that sensitively. Um, my experience of other colleagues is not as good as that. <laughs> to be honest yeah. with um, okay. <laughs> from from all all the all the schools oh, yeah. that, that I'm aware of, yeah. uh, um, that yeah. was very well articulated, and I can follow that, and I can feel into yeah. that. I think that that's absolutely right. That's the way that it goes. And yes, uh, the idea of context, I think, is the the, the self healing, trying to yeah. work itself through because yeah. context is everything ultimately yeah. that makes meaning. Yeah. Right. bringing trauma well, for sure yes because then, then we're in the land of better instincts aren't we yeah. really and um i think the thing about uh ritual which which i think you mentioned earlier is this ritual without meaning is ocd most of the time yeah. and that's what we tend to see yeah. Yeah. um and so you know you just get that repetition compulsion or you get sim symptom substitution so things you know shift from one focus to another that might or might not be similar to the you know the original configuration but ultimately i think with respect to trauma specifically, creating a new context or uh, helping somebody to um, to get into their meta instincts properly and, and create a completely new scenario is the way to move them beyond it. Otherwise, it, from our experience, it tends to just be this tendency, if you like, to repeat things, whether it's um, in terms of, you know, overt symptomology or the kinds of dreams that people have or, or whatever. So for, for us, meaning is key. It is. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. That, I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, that's, I've always, I always say that the brain is a meaning making organ. Uh, that's, it's, it's a thing. It does that. that. That's what it does. Like the heart pumps blood, the brain makes meaning. <laughs> Uh, and so that seems like the the goal of the continuous goal of the process the attempt is to uh, integrate the event into the ongoing personal narrative of of me and and that's constantly being updated right you know some people might talk about the default mode network and the autobiographical memory and all that kind of jazz and i think that's what's really kind of constantly grinding in the background it's always yeah. processing yeah, totally. and with dreams you get to really see it because everything else is shut down the external world is completely shut down and shut off you can't even move you're paralyzed yeah. and so the brain has nothing else to do but really work on that so that's you know i mean nature is like well you're going to be sleeping eight hours a day but we're going to make you work anyway because you know you got stuff to do yeah. <laughs> during that time yeah. um so uh, now you mentioned ocd it's a great point um I feel like that a lot of this processing, if it isn't externalized somehow into some kind of action into the environment, it gets lost. Like, so if you, if you're preoccupied with the internal world to a high degree, like in um, studies of the default mode network, speaking of that, in folks that are psychotic, like schizophrenics show an overactivity of that. So it seems like what's going on is that they're overly internally directed and yeah. in extreme psychosis, you're in your own world, which is certainly the experience you get with them. Yeah. Like you're like, am I even here? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, then they're like, well, maybe today, but, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. but then the flip side of that would be preoccupation, preoccupation with the external world and ignoring the inner world, in which case you end up with things like neurotic behaviors and oh maybe ocds and stuff like the, the 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 mind is like trying to push the meaning into the world not just create a bunch of meaning and then sit there and navel gaze about it yes yeah yes right yeah yeah, yeah totally agree <clears throat> yeah i think that was very well explicated oh, yeah. Um, so the ego, in, in the way I look at it, is the ego's job is to try to mediate the two and not be too much one way or the other. Would that make sense in your system? Yes, it, it, it does. And I think like everything else, we have to tailor our approach to our context. And, and listening to you then, um, you know, without the backup of somebody like yourself, um, there are places that people like ourselves shouldn't go. We shouldn't push our remit into those areas where it's entirely appropriate and singularly appropriate yeah. for psychiatrists to operate. Yeah. 
uh, and that that's why we you know we always work as far as is possible with medics i would not want to work without that, that no. backup and support right and um, when you mentioned uh, psych psychosis and schizophrenia in particular mm. that, that's that's the obvious one but it's also true sometimes for other things as well and, and going back towards what you're saying about um being too externally focused and uh, young would have I think probably thought that's too much extroversion and perhaps extroverted intuition uh, because you get hysteria with that it seems that, that mm. there's too much of a, an attachment to the object mm. and a loss of yeah. self on the inside then you get this kickback which is a reciprocal resonance that somaticizes because things aren't being properly dealt with externally so yeah there's all sorts of that but but I guess where I was trying to go, sorry about that, I've done my preamble now all over the place, <laughs> um, was is that we've, we've, we find that an instinctive model, I know it's, some people find this very boring, you know, <laughs> like going about instincts, but... Not me, I love instincts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, we couldn't do much without them, could we? Uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> no. No, the, the Panksepian instincts, without a context, to express themselves yeah. legitimately, yeah. And therefore, by legitimate, I mean satisfying the genome. Yeah, that seems to be the fundamental cause of neurosis, and that's very close to Freud. Mm -hmm. But once it met that that insight, I think he had met his personality and his context. It, it took on a, a shape. It collapsed into Sigmund Freud, and, uh, and then, then we had all the things downstream of that. Right. All the like, like penis envy and all other kind of stuff. <laughs> so what what he called the it, and unfortunately focused on what he was experiencing which was frustrated sexuality and aggression instinct became reduced to that yeah because mm. we know that's not the case we know that the the, the, the primary instinct panksepian instinct is seeking it's on all the time except in dreams as you say it's switched off um but if that has no context it's and it still runs when we're up and about then we, we tend to guess the neurotic conflict that the freud saw but he misinterpreted it all as being sexual and aggressive mm. and right. It isn't. We've got the Adlerian elements, which in Panksef will have to do with uh, Kerr, for example, and play. Yeah. And then we can move into the Jungian element. They're all present simultaneously, all those collapsed resolutions of, of, of uh, what happens when those things go wrong, in the mm. sense that they don't have a context, which feeds back to what you were saying earlier, I think, about trauma. Mm -hmm. If, if tr um, you can give, and Pauline mentioned it, if there's um, a proper context yeah. to attach somebody's instinctive drives to mm. they seem to naturally update themselves yeah so say, so say so if we were to just what i mean by update themselves mm. i mean the individual updates from within mm. because the context mm. without yes. matches that which is pushing yes in other words what is behind the panksepian instincts which is from the genome and it's the ontology of lifespan development is saying context context there is no context neurosis at a minimum yeah mm. but if there is a context then things start to update sorry Paul. no it's okay it, it just i was just thinking then if, if we were to maybe take the example um of say the the soldier who had the P, the one we talked about last time yeah. Yeah. Had ptsd uh and and we were to hypothesize i guess that part of what drove him to maybe become a soldier and, and go to war in the first place was say a seeking system and given that that you know has led to him being traumatized in the way that he has if, if it were possible to find another context for his seeking system yeah. going forward yeah. that uh, allowed him to I don't know, have that sense of exploration and, and adventure, but in, in a more positive way, that that would be the thing that would move him beyond the previous trauma, ultimately, yeah. just, just as an example. Yeah. Well, with him, uh, if we're going to use him as an example, so yeah. I think where the way that I would frame it in these terms, uh, not so much with seeking, but with rage. Right. Uh, with him, he had definitely had decontextualized rage, which you often see in PTSD, it's mm -hmm. just cranked up to 11 and it's sort of like attack, whatever. And it's very easy to trigger it and uh, all this stuff. And so he, the way he put it was that he would go into Terminator mode. Yes. And um, when, when I heard that, my uh, approach with him was to let, let's see if we can't make sense of that, or right? rather than treat it as the enemy and try to therapize it away and all of this uh, type of stuff that some therapists do. Yeah. I'm like, no, it's there for a reason. Yeah. And he, he was like, 
Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like when he he would complain about stuff like, um, you know, somebody would flip him off uh, on, on the highway and we'd like chase him down into a parking lot and get ready to beat the crap out of him. And, you know, his girlfriend would like pull him back yeah. and he, he didn't want to be like that. Or somebody would barely brush against him at the grocery store and he'd be ready to take his block off, you know. Yeah. And he was like, I don't want to be like that. That's just crazy. You know, I'm, I feel like I'm nuts, you know, and I'm like, you're not nuts. This is the trauma. It triggered the rage. Yeah. It gave you this Terminator mode personality because you needed it, right? You were got people bombing you and shooting at you. you you're not going to be able to sit down and sing Kumbaya with them, right? You're going to go kill them or, or you're going to die, right? So this is do or die. This is instinct, pens, you know, like you say, pens up in instinct level. Yeah. And so uh, gradually we gained to appreciate that side of himself. And, and I said, you know, what else does it do for you? You know, and uh, he he came to realize and he talked a lot about how uh, when he was in Terminator mode, he wasn't afraid yeah. and he was able to accomplish the mission. He was able to push through the scary stuff. And I'm like, see, that's why it's there. But you just don't need it anymore. Yeah. It's but it's OK to still have it in you know reserve if you do. <laughs> yeah. And so but of course, all of that stuff is contextualizing it. And attaching it to a new, would this be correct to say that I was attaching it to a different kind of meta instinct? Yeah, a hmm. narrative. Yeah, the a narrative, new narrative. It's definitely that. And, and that, that does provide the safe context. And that's a haven in and of itself, but it's a real one because it's adapted to. And the, the updating comes from within and says this is now the appropriate way to express this. And a haven yeah. at that point would appear to be what it is an artifact that's imposed on a natural system. Um, yeah, I think that was really interesting mm. on a number of levels. Um, I, I've never been in a war, but I, I've, I've had trauma. I've had traumatic experiences in my life, and I've, I've spent time in my own life trying to sort that out. Mm. <laughs> sure, yeah. So some idea what, the, what what that's like. And I have, yeah. I've actually worked with some American veterans from Iraq and Afghanistan, and mm. not, not to the extent that you have, obviously not, nowhere near it, um, because you've, you have very extensive experience uh, with, with U.S. military veterans. Mm. Uh, but, but some and, and some UK guys but that, that is really interesting mm. I, I feel um, and to me to take it away from, momentarily from the context of uh, trauma I found that, that rage is very much associated it seems as a, as a Panksepian state where there's a loss of status or status and how might that fit so mm -hmm. Obviously, if you're, you're in role, you identify with it, you have a function and a context, then you're less likely to feel misplaced. Uh, and I am adaptive yeah. in, in role. If the role is you are a terminator and you can do that, that that's good. Yeah. Provided the context is there. You then lose your context, but the drive is still there. And there's no legitimate way to be that way anymore. You're out of sync. And that immediately is neurotic for anyone. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and the rage then is I've lost my status. Yeah. yeah. Um, and at a, at a very minimal level, nowhere near this guy, obviously. I remember when I, when I came out the police, I, I hated the police, uh, particularly towards the end, uh, what I was going through, um, because I, I, I took a stand against corruption and uh, I, it nearly cost us everything oh, yeah. to do that. Um, but anyway, that's another story. But when I came out, yeah. I thought, this is it, I'm, I'm gone. And I had dreams for years that they would come to the door, knock yeah. on the door and hand me my hat. And I had to go back because mm. I hadn't completed it. Mm. Huh. Interesting. Yeah, I was haunted by you it, were. literally yes, haunted. And I, I found that despite myself, there were things that I missed, which meant I couldn't readily go 100 percent into Civvy Street. You know, I mean, when I was in the police, I was doing part time work in, in a hospital. I mean, I've even got my police staff appraisals where they acknowledge this. I still got copies of it. You know, and this was up at a hospital, the courtesy of a psychiatrist, actually. <laughs> uh, psychiatric social workers, clinical psychologists who were right. psychotherapists and I was being mentored by them. And I was in that, that split state. I wanted to be that. I was doing some work while I was studying as well. Uh, but the police was the main thing that was imposing on me. And uh, um, so it, I missed things when I came out. I thought I wouldn't. Yeah. And then it dawned on me what I was missing, but I had to go really deep to find it. And mm. it was very simple and it's very instinctive. Not only did I have a role, I had a responsibility, which put me in touch with certain instincts because the police have a beat. They're utterly responsible for that. Right. Day, yeah. But that's what we were like. It's not like that now in the UK. 
but but we had to we had to do it that that was like a shark a predator but you didn't pick on the good people you went looking for the bad people you were right. to attack those and the, the, there was it was highly territorial you had to know everybody you had to know exactly where you were 24 7 if anything kicked off you needed to know where am i right now what's my relationship to the environment mm -hmm. uh, you know daylight any weather wherever like that and actually, oh, that's a lot of seeking oh, activity there a lot of seeking yes. um but there's also care because you care for people yes. That's There's right. You're the defender. You're right. The, the the zone defense in basketball terms, right? You, yeah. This is my area. Nobody gets in here. <laughs> Nobody yeah. hurts anybody in here. <laughs> Not yeah. on my watch. You, you, you do feel like that. And there's some rivalry with your colleagues as they're on adjacent beats. And of course, you support one another, but but you have your own beat. Yeah. And the, yeah. the group pressure is you look after your beat. And if anything goes wrong and you haven't found it or whatever, that's your fault. And you feel that state, I have to do this. Mm -hmm. That was the mm. play in the form of hierarchy was the you know, pretty much everything apart from lust. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Although I'm not calling Although there were I'm, opportunities I, I, for it. <laughs> <laughs> well, we won't get into that. Right? <laughs> no, no, no. no. <laughs> I'm not going to get into trouble for that job. But, <laughs> but anyway. Um, but anyway. <laughs> all those instincts were there. And mm. I lost the opportunity to experience them in that raw form when I left completely. When I was in it, I didn't like it. And when I left it, I missed it. And they, yeah. they came for me to claim me back. Mm -hmm. uh, that was another light bulb moment for me. Well, that sounds actually very similar to many stories that I heard from soldiers coming back from combat. They didn't like it then. They don't like the PTSD symptoms, da da da, da. But then they would always say, I wish I could go back there. Yeah. It was the time when I felt most alive. Mm. Yeah. And that's very puzzling to a lot of folks until you really get at the Panksepian instincts of it. And you recognize that when they're there, they're fully engaged. All emotions are firing mm. on all cylinders. And you're, you're, you're in the environment, right? You're, they're all firing. And then when you come home and it's the world of, you know, Kardashians and Denny's and, yeah. and all this silly crap that is just yeah. mean, meaningless consumerism, it doesn't register, you know, it doesn't resonate. I, and I, they feel I like if life is meaningless. Oh yeah. I, I certainly agree with that because the most, alive that I felt in that job was was uh, responding to an emergency call at some distance because you've got to get there yeah and the the driving that you have to do and knowing that someone's life is dependent upon you or when you get there you don't know what you're going to meet and yeah, you're engaged at that point you're like yeah. you're fully engaged you've got, you've got, anchor you've, together. yeah you've got yeah. to survive the journey because yeah. you have to exceed yeah. safety in terms of uh, moving a vehicle around a high speed mm. Uh, in an environment that you're responsible if you hit anybody or you could you know you should never have an accident yourself on the way to help anyone else but then you get there and um i, I have had incidents facing unarmed facing people with firearms i've, I've had that threat i've had uh, involved with terrorists murderers all sorts of things i've had dogs set on me i've been jumped by gangs uh, injured in riots uh, all sorts and you just don't know and it was horrible but you miss it it's so odd it's so strange. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's a certain amount of, uh, I think that the, the genome expects conflict and mayhem. Yeah. And if it's not there, it kind of goes dormant. It kind of goes into, you know, la la land mode, right? But if it if happens again, it kicks in, right? And so this weird jolt, jolt of energy. Yeah. I mean, this is this is very much, I'm going to appear sexist here, but it's very much men's territory in a way, which is absolutely fine. There's no no problem with that. But it means to some extent, I, I'll, I'll have to ask questions that, that help me to understand really something of what goes on for, for veterans and also your experience too, Stephen, the yeah. police. And the, the, I guess the question I, I have is that say, you know, you go into combat or you go in into the police, which is a kind of combat, really, yeah, in a way, be. and a yeah. kind of uh, maybe a, a less acute sort of basis. Um, is that do you think that if you go into either of those situations with, say, um, a dialed up rage system, mm -hmm. that you come out more likely to be traumatized and say, if you went in with, without point. it? Wow, a personal. Uh, I'm not sure. Um, I wonder if, like in this, in those sorts of situations, maybe you going into it 
dialed up. I'm not sure if that would be an advantage or not, really. Um, like getting attacked and all that sort of stuff will certainly trigger it. And um, the patient that we've been talking about, um, he didn't have anywhere for that rage to go because it was still ramped up when he came home. And so what he would do is do cage fighting. Well, he would, yeah, like bare knuckle cage fighting. And uh, he was very quick to tell me that he'd never injured anybody. Yeah. <laughs> Which is kind of interesting thing to say. <laughs> But uh, but he also he also told me he never lost either. And I'm like, I'm sure you didn't because <laughs> he was a very powerful guy. And, um, you know, so and he said that when he was doing that, he was in the in that zone, like a zone of engagement. You know, that it's, it's kind of like a repetition compulsion, like I'm trying to recreate that situation of combat that really got me feeling like this alive. Yes. You know. And then, of course, you get the accolades and it's all socially acceptable to go beat the crap out of somebody and all of that kind of thing. Um, you know, but within the within the, the the boundaries of I don't injure anybody, I don't break any bones or anything like that. And so it was kind of a highly controlled, cathartic, brief, cathartic experience. But of course, once it, it was over and the crowd dispersed, mm -hmm. it was kind of back to square one. But that's, yeah, so. that's interesting what you say, mm -hmm. the idea of getting accolades, because you, you're mm -hmm. asking right that guys are more likely to get accolades for that than they are for coming back from a war i mean where right. where, where are the people to welcome in welcome them back i mean we we've certainly mm. had situations here in the uk mm. um where you know these poor guys come back and it's like they've been fighting for queen and country and the, the, there is no one there literally to you know, applaud them or give them accolades. There's nothing. And so, um, you know, how could anybody possibly make a transition from that to civilian life in, you know, in a normal way? It's, you know, there's, there's not even that ritual of returning home and having people yeah. give you those accolades. But you're right to say in something like this is how perverse it all gets. Then something like the UFC, which is a relative, you know, obviously bad things happen, but still a relatively controlled environment, that mm. that somehow should be, you know, um, those people should be seen as heroes, mm -hmm. whereas those other guys very often aren't. I mean, it's a, it's a sad indictment, isn't it? it? It's bizarre. Yeah, it is. Yes. But, but your, your comment about the ritual of coming home, I think, is really important. Um, in World War II, at least in the States, the folks that came back from World War II were on big bong, were on boat, bong boat trips. Yes. And uh, they would travel as an entire unit. Yes. So uh, if you're on a boat for a month coming home from big, the big war, what do you think you're doing? You're yes. talking stories and, and sharing experiences and all this with people who get it. You know, it's almost like group therapy. Yes. Yes. And then they come home and there's parades and there's confetti yes. and there's all this stuff, you know. Yeah. Um, but Vietnam was completely different from that. We had a rotation system where people could be home in 48 hours once their rotation. They didn't come with anybody. They just hop on a chopper and they were out of there. And they come home and, of course, people are spitting on them and telling them they're baby killers and all that kind of thing. Well, no wonder there's so much trauma developed. There's no way to put a meta narrative on that. No. Uh, it's OK. I'm just effed up. And that's my problem. Yeah. And so unfortunately in the VA system, you know, sometimes people would get kind of institutionalized in the sense of identifying as a PTSD person. Mm. I'm, hell, I'm, I'm yeah. so-and-so, I have PTSD from, from NAM, yeah. you know, and, and the subsequent wars haven't really helped that a whole lot. They haven't really figured that out yet that when I was in the air force, they were still trying to figure out ways to try to get out of what they called battle mind, um, mm -hmm. which is to shift them back to civilian life and outside of the, they were at least recognizing that there's there's an issue here that uh, when you're there, when you're in the combat, you're in a particular state of mind, and you don't need to be in when you get home. <laughs> but now, interestingly enough, one of the last uh, dreams that a patient uh, that we've been talking about here presented to me was um, he had, he was in a shower with his ex-wife and two of her girlfriends. And um, he, you know, he woke up and he, he wrote it, he was writing in his journal. He's like, I, I don't know what's up with that dream, but I don't mind. Ha ha ha, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but then I thought, you know, I've really thought about it. And it, it, what it reminded me of was the, um, the one of the stories of Cuchulain, the Irish warrior. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And there's a story about him when he's coming back from his rampage all over Ireland. And of course, in, in this is Irish mythology. So everything's cranked up to 11. 
and imagery and <laughs> you know everything is exaggerated out the wazoo but anyway he's so he's coming home and he's getting ready to go back to the ulster town and they are saying no no you're too you're still battle raged right you'll kill us all if you come in here right because he was you know and so what they did is they brought a huge they had 50 naked women bring him a uh, a big vat of water and he jumps into it and it explodes so then they bring another one and he jumps into it and all the water boils away and then the finally the third one he jumps into it and he cools off and now he's allowed to join you know, <laughs> civilized society but see yeah. see how you can see the, oh, the yeah. similarity there and the imagery is very similar yeah it's very you've cool. got the naked women you got the water you get the cool down you've got getting back into civilian life all that's there and he had no he had no exposure to that that mythology right it's kind of obscure but um it had the same theme mm -hmm. right there of mm -hmm. uh, i need to figure out how to of course there's the washing element uh of the symbolism of the of that which is throughout the world and all kinds of symbolism uh transitioning from one state to the next often involves bathing in water mm -hmm. you know uh and then the intimacy and the sexuality and all that kind of stuff uh, because if you're involved in that it's you're less likely to be involved in all this other destruction and chaos you know so um well wow, there's so many that was kind of a uh, there's a lot of layers going on there but i mean it was sim trying to retransition actually the very last dream he reported to me was that he was in basic training which i thought was interesting like starting back at where ground zero to relearn what he needed to learn and he was leaving the military in the dream uh with a girlfriend <laughs> Yeah. So there was the anima, you know, connection there, uh, all that stuff. So, uh, but we don't see if we don't do the ritual, then yeah. there's no way to externalize all this stuff, this this instinct. Yeah. Yeah. So um, that's that's what led me to kind of think of uh, psychotherapy as a ritual that we do in our world, mm -hmm. in the modern, you know, Western industrialized nations and so forth. Yeah. When I was looking at healing rituals around the world. Mm -hmm to compare mm. and uh, by comparison um psychotherapy is very cerebral it's very inward looking there's not a whole lot of externalization generally speaking you're you're self-accepted of course um but in you know just kind of average therapy style cbt and all that it's all just in here yeah, yeah. and there's not a whole lot of externalization i think yeah. and so in, in one of my books i gave an example i wanted to share with you guys um the temple of asclepios Oh yeah, yeah. You may have heard of that. Okay. Yeah. So uh, I'll just go through it for the for the three you know fans out there listening to this. Um, you the first the person is isolated, and then they engage in these relaxation exercises, and then they have to make a sacrifice of some kind, pay a huge fee to the temple, <laughs> and then make sure they attend to their dreams. They sleep in the temple overnight. They wake up. They report their dreams to the physician, who then interprets it and gives them things to do to get better, to heal from whatever it is. Um, and a lot of scholars have looked at this and, um, you know, asked like, well, psychologically, what what's this do? What does this do to a person? How might it help them get better? Um, a guy named Richard Creighton, um, who is a psychoanalyst and also a neuroscientist. Hmm. And a Jungian actually um, wrote some really cool books on this subject, and he he brought this up, and he thought, well, maybe what this does is it um, uh, it, it mentally prepares them for the imagery to emerge that will help them to heal through contextualization, and then of course the, the physician, if they're intuitive enough, can tell them what to do to get them get that stuff externalized, mm -hmm. so they can actually get better. But I wanted your all's thoughts on that. Well, that, as yeah. you're saying it, and I think that's absolutely brilliant. And um, the way that you you mentioned intuition as well, uh, that that's a very hard quality to to define or to to generate it in someone. But it probably has to be there mm. because it's a kind of information processing that involves a real engagement. Without intuition, there's no rapport. Yeah. Mm. We have to That's get beyond what's obvious. Mm. We kind of tunes into that resonance field, doesn't it? Yes. With the other person. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. It seems like that going through that process would really prepare a person to engage with the self or with the imagination or the psyche or the genome or whatever every word you want to put on it, the unconscious. Yeah. Um, with all of that isolation, so it gets them to to really kind of turn inwardly. 
and then uh, the, re the relaxation exercises. But what the then there's the sacrifice and the fee paying. And that's an interesting piece there. Uh, I don't. I think it would not work as well if you didn't do that. What do you think? Without the sacrifice. Without the sacrifice and the fee. That's a that's a really good point. As you've been speaking, I've been thinking about our mm. enactment process, which mm. I think you're aware of, which we generate um, a process that can last all day in an isolated environment, um, mm. and we put people, but we, we select for them very carefully. Yeah. A lot of people who train with us want to do it, our kind of enactments immediately, and really they, they shouldn't. You know, it, it's a skill, and it has to come through training, experience, insight, and, and so forth. Yeah, as a huge amount of trust. <clears throat> um, obviously, there are fees because we have yeah. to get a venue. Yeah, um, we would support people who couldn't pay if they need. Right, it. and and of course the fee is there for for instrumental reasons but i think psychologically it's important for the patient to pay a fee because then it be, it's a unfakeable way that you've committed to the process right you can always refuse the fee if there's no fee though you can kind of bs your way through it and yeah. you kind of go through the motions and all this stuff but you're not going to do that as it's less likely i think for you to do that if you've got some money on the line yeah. Right. So, and our placebo studies have shown that more expensive treatments actually work better. Yes. Even if it's the exact same thing, if it's more costs you more. And so I think that they're, they're, they're queuing into that, like the ancients yeah. figured this out. Yeah. Um, and yeah, then of course the sacrifice is the yeah. same thing. It is. It's about the, the, the value you place on something, whether, whether you, um, you know, it, it's a monetary value or some other kind of value. Nonetheless, it's a valuing of the, of the process. And as you say, people are more likely to engage, I think, when they feel that, this, that they're doing something worthwhile. Um, so, yeah. I, I, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. It's just something that we've discussed we over many, many years, mm. really. Um, <laughs> because I have mm. noticed that the people who get something for nothing don't actually get it. No, they don't. Um, it's true what you get is a ramping up of the demand mm. and you get an infantile transference very often, not always, but, but yeah. often. Yeah. It often can happen, often. Sure. Um, so I can certainly see where you're coming from, from that. Uh, but yeah. there is a part of me that would rather be able to not have to do that, but we live yeah. in the world and we do. Yeah. Um, but yeah, to, to go back to the enactment, there's, there's a considerable commitment there because there would be a team of therapists. The way we do them is not like a psychodrama. There'll be, Sometimes a family, we have done them with families or, or relationships, but usually it's one person who may or may not have a chaperone and there'll be a team of therapists. They don't know who they are, but the therapists have been briefed and they're experienced and there'll be a therapist, a lead therapist, it might be Pauline or myself usually, uh, and were, the, the full background is understood and, and ready and we have this controlled environment, access is, is controlled, lighting is controlled, mm. heat is controlled. And the room is full of props and a team are fully briefed and they know what to do and when to do it and how to engage with that person. So like a, is that like a giant sand play sort of thing? Yes, it, it, it yeah. certainly generates a dreamlike state very, very quickly. I'm, I'm sure. Um, and we use music and uh, any kind of medium that we can. Uh, and uh, that, that's a process. And there's a proper debriefing as well. We have this motto, uh, no Humpty Dumpties, you know, we put the person back together again or we don't go home it's as simple as that um so well, that's really interesting you know i've seen um i've read about that kind of process being used with um things like um hallucinogens to uh, to facilitate but it, i'm not convinced that that's necessary yeah. i think a lot of times it's the ritual structure that does a lot of the work for you yeah and uh adding an entheogen or something like that into it is um you know just sort of like nitroglycerin or something you know it's like turbo boosting it but it, it's not necessary really no. but definitely sounds like a ritual uh it's, it's, well there's a shamanistic element. an extensive one yeah there is a shamanistic yeah, there element. is yeah yeah mm -hmm. so i wanted to uh share with you some some interesting stuff um from the leech book uh which is i don't know if you know what that is but it's a 10th century book of remedies that i oh, studied wow. a lot yeah i read through it um when I was working on healing symbols in psychotherapy. Um, and I thought it was really fascinating because these old, these ancient remedies are extremely psychological and symbolic. 
Um, if you look at them and take them literally, they make absolutely no sense and they don't make any physiological sense. And it's very easy for the modern eye to look at it and go, well, they're just a bunch of ignorant, you know, ancient people that don't know anything. Not, you know, they're not super intelligent like we are, <laughs> but they knew some stuff that I think we've forgotten about, which is the, the psychological and the symbolic dimension of what you're doing. Um, so I'll, I'll share with you uh, their remedy for a headache. Okay, so they're for an old, there's, they've got a remedy for an old headache and a remedy for a very old headache. <laughs> so one that's been there for a long time, in other words, like chronic headaches. Yeah. <laughs> so for the old headache, you take penny royal, you boil it in oil or butter, and then you rub the temples with it and then above the eyes and then to the center of the head. So this is one, two, three thing that you do with it. And then the last line of the entry there is, though his mind be turned, he is hale, um, turned and this tense actually had a, a meaning of twisted by magic. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at the old English. Mm -hmm. So um, that's the old headache. Um, Penny Royal, by the way, uh, in old English is, I'm gonna probably mispronounce it, but it's Dwerge Dwosel. <laughs> it just means dwarf plant. And of course, dwarves from the mythology were stone spirits. So I thought that was interesting that they, because I always ask, like, just like a dream, like why that plant and not some other plant? It's not arbitrary. They picked them for a particular reason for the characteristics of it. So, or the name, mm. in this case, a plant associated with the earth and with stone and that kind of spirit. And then you, you boil it and you do all this stuff. So if it's a really old headache though, you've got a whole lot more work to do. You have to find little stones in the stomachs of swallow fledglings. Oh my yeah. And then you have to hold them so they don't touch the earth or water or other stones, which maintains their sort of symbolic purity. There's no contamination, right? That's always a big part of magic. Sew them together in whatever with whatever you want to, and then put them on the person whom they are on whom they are needful. Better will soon be for him. <laughs> so the thing about this is the difficulty I think with achieve of with getting the items puts a ton of symbolic energy into the objects, wouldn't you say? Oh, yes, absolutely. Yeah. Right. So I think what I see in this, I don't know what you all see in these in these silly remedies, but uh, well, of course, they weren't silly back then, is that they are doing these things to invest the physical object with symbolic meaning and then using them in, in a way to uh, help a person get better through the uh, manipulation of those objects that have so much symbolic energy in them through the acts. Right, so we create the symbolic energy and the, and the psychological meaning through the stuff that we do. And that is how it might activate things like placebo responses uh, to help a person get better. Because that's mainly what they had at their disposal at the time. They didn't have a whole lot of neuroscience at their disposal. Yeah. <laughs> but placebos are very powerful and they can be very effective. Yeah. But, it, but you have to know what you're doing with them, right? You have to, you can't just, throw a sugar pill at somebody and say, good luck, <laughs> right? And, that's, and this, is, this is what they do in uh, gold, like so-called gold standard trials. I've been part of some of these. When Lyrica was first being studied as a medication, hmm. um, I, I helped out with one of the studies at University of Cincinnati as a medical student. And the, the person running the study said, they deliberately tell them that maybe it'll work and maybe it won't to try to minimize placebo responses so that the medication would sh have a better showing in the study. And I'm like, is that ethical? Uh, I don't know if that's right. <laughs> I don't think it is, but I'm not the boss. You know, but then looking back at that, I'm like, why are you not using the symbolic power of the mind to help the person get better because their agenda was to get the medication approved for FDA yeah. and you know all that, all that stuff. So anyway, I just I just threw a ton of stuff at you. I was curious of what, what your thoughts were about about this dimension of it. Yeah I, I again I, I I think everything you said I agree with everything you said and um the, the negative elements of suggestion there to say to someone it may or it may not work means that it, it can cut either way. Um, yes absolutely they call that the nocebo effect. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah. Like no susception is rather painful, you know, mm. in that sense of the, the no placebo because yeah. it will one, mm. and that's one of the issues with some of the rationalistic psychologies that mm. they're, they're too cut and dried about the the opposites that they play with, 
and mm. that can leave a person with a choice to choose which one does my neurosis want to support yeah. and it might yeah. be I'll, I'll take the negative thank you because i'm comfortable with that and my context that i believe in will receive that and there'll be mm. you know mm. and that's still on the surface mm. because deeper than that there is a part that wants to regulate that but there's a habit element in accepting polarity and, and maintaining the stasis generated by a polarity but it's so easy to to trigger in someone yeah. and this is another reason isn't it why we, we, we always as, as you mentioned at the beginning professor godwin we, we go in directly to ask the unconscious for help yeah um, then mm. we, we bypass all of this yeah you skip the middleman you just go directly to the source <laughs> yeah and, and people start to get well even if they don't want to and they get really obsessed <laughs> <laughs> okay that's pretty interesting <laughs> another part of you that wants it to go <laughs> and guess what when, when it goes it'll release all sorts of other nice things for you and then it's like oh okay <laughs> so <laughs> that, that's a different way of using suggestion mm. but it's not a lie because the unconscious will agree with it and it will only agree with it if it can deliver and because it wants to deliver well and that's what i was thinking about here with these uh remedies is that these are written down in in the context of a culture which understood and believed in all of these symbols mm. very much so and so it's very likely i think to have probably would have worked yeah very effectively if someone who comes along of course they even back then a leech leech book it just means doctor book leech is an old english is doctor and so a leech had a high level of respect and he comes along and, or she comes along and says this is what needs to be done right and of course you the leech book is very clear that you have to make sure that you present everything is absolutely true and this is effective this is highly effective you know so because <laughs> that again that suggestion from an authority figure that has been built up through the culture and all this kind of stuff it's going to carry a lot of weight yeah yeah well that, that's so true isn't it sorry yeah. Steve you were going to I was just going to say that um the where Professor Goodwin embedded yeah. that was yeah. actually the thing I, I think that makes it work is yes. that it's embedded within the culture which supports yeah. it mm. and probably this is my view for what it's worth is that, that how that will work is through a kind of super positioning of information mm. um so the intuition that the the author of the leeches uh, work uh, has or had informed them in a collapsed way about how many things will work mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. delivered a mechanism mm -hmm. within the the bandwidth of the super positioning which is biopsychosocial therefore cultural and then you get a resonance and you get an outcome mm. but if that's mm. not there if that's not there and we're hyper rational about it yeah it's not gonna work yeah, yeah that's right if the person's dismissive of it or if the doctor's dismissive yes. of it yes yeah all yes. the bets are off yeah well you you can't appear to be ambivalent at all me, really can you and i mean i was watching a a medical program the other night and uh there was some poor guy, I think he'd come off his motorbike and fractured his femur and, and, the, and the doctor who was about to give him some ketamine in, in the back of the ambulance was ambivalent in the way that she suggested it would work in so much as rather than saying, you know, I'm going to give you this and, and you won't have any short term memory of, of what I'm about to do, which was obviously she was just about to reduce the fracture. Um, she gave the impression that there was the possibility that he might still, you know, experience something and have some memory of that experience. So I think if you deliver ambivalence like that, yeah, I and mean, that's just really awful. People, uh, yeah. yeah, people will default to the negative. They will. Yeah. Always yeah. when they're, they're offered an, an, um, a choice like that, the defensive reaction is to prefer for the negative. Yes. So they prefer yeah. they prefer for that. Yeah. And what attention they have is yeah. focused on generating the scenario yeah. to make sense of the anticipation of distress or pain yeah. and I well, that's why the, i was going to say that's why the leech book writers strongly advises 100 percent confidence and it's not unique to the leech book either that's yeah. uh all sorts of different ritual practitioners around the world have that and so they they figured that out a millennia ago and it just became part of the tradition and now of course we have to relearn that and we've got physicians and people who should know better doing silly stuff like that. Yes. Yeah. And right. unfortunately, creating symptoms yeah. with their words. Yes. Well, they do. And, yeah. and who knows what neurosis that might have generated 
downstream none, none of us will really know uh, mm-hmm. and at the, the end of the day I guess the guy will just have you know was just glad that he had his fracture reduced but mm-hmm. he may have got something more into the bargain that won't actually materialize yet who, who knows uh, you know what that might have done to him downstream so I, I think you're right to say that whoever delivers the message has to do it with sufficient authority yeah. and rapport that it has its effect in the first place and then it has yeah. Steve was saying that has to then be supported by the culture as well so we kind of you know we kind of meet it from all angles in a way to make sure that yeah. whatever yeah. the problem is it's just kind of boxed off isn't it really it is and of course the ultimate authority uh, that a person can feel rather than it being projected or transferred mm. onto a third party will come from the utter certainty that they suddenly feel from within yes yeah and then the external figure is is actively handed yeah. the ability to heal yeah right rather yeah. than it being presumed through transference which can always shatter or break mm. and that's another reason why we always ask the unconscious to help and when mm. it says it will we're yeah. completely confident because you do get the result yeah and the confidence right. about the results yeah mm. I, I think that that must be the the key ingredient to this um in the sense that because in so many other cultures and throughout history the cultures have been with established traditions the rapport was almost instantaneous because it was just bought in uh, you know oh here comes the person that everyone agrees is going to be the healer that's going to help you and you know, you just listen to what do they what they say i think in that case the rapport is kind of built into the system and so the unconscious is going to generally i think be on board Mm. whereas we don't live in a world like that you and i don't live in the modern western world which is like that everything is up in the air and hyper you know rationalized and all that so you all have figured out that if i don't ask for permission and then not necessarily going to get it yeah. so i need to uh, establish that beforehand yeah in order to get the buy-in that i think other cultures probably would have kind of automatically had yeah that's my theory anyway <laughs> right yes yeah so many safeguards mm. built into that process so it, it, you're not depending on you you're asking for permission but you're demonstrating that the, the permission is capable of being given and then that it is given and then you can yeah. have genuine confidence and communicate genuine confidence so the rapport field is very powerful at that point mm. yeah um, if it was like here's your cbt homework or i'll give you <laughs> additional positive regard yeah yeah it's like what these are all demands you don't even know me or understand me uh, uh, so but if you ask them deeply that they feel something very very odd that they've never felt probably before that there is a unifying sense of their being this is the Jungian self archetype mm. very easy to ask you just have to do it but the Jungians don't yeah. they think it takes forever yeah <laughs> well it's almost i wonder it seems to me that sometimes people it's like they don't quite believe what they're saying about the psyche. Mm. And you know, isn't that strange? Like they'll, they'll say all this stuff about the healing power of the self, but then they don't actually treat it like the thing that they say it is, which is this autonomous entity as center of the psyche. And if it's an autonomous entity, then it hears what you're talking about and yes. saying. And so you, you need to think about that, you know? <laughs> yeah. And, and again, this is where the dissociation method comes in really handy because a person can, once they feel that communication, that acknowledgement, they can f- feel again, safe enough to stand aside and witness another part of them communicating with you while you talk to that as if they're not there. It's like you've left your car at a garage at one you trust. It has to be one you trust. <laughs> right. <laughs> the car is agreed with <laughs> <laughs> and then you're watching what's going on on the closed circuit you're watching, watching what's going on yeah. and, um, yeah. that's great i feel confident about the work because i've allowed it to happen and the trust has been built up and i've watched it and everything's working better so it's it's a natural process dynamic but we, we kind of learn this the hard way when when yeah. faced with very complicated and apparently intractable problems yeah they were, they were all medical referrals, you know, we, we got the, med- that was, that was where we cut our teeth was, was this was GP practices mainly and a very high fr- uh, throughput because uh, uh, they, they would start to send the most complicated 
people they could like can you solve this one deliberately, can you? Yeah. deliberately. <laughs> and, <laughs> a new challenge all oh, right the, the, a new rubik's cube to deal with <laughs> the cbt people in the same practice and they'd get the revolving door on no result but we were getting results over and over and over and over again nice. it, it was the approach yeah they, they tried great. everything, didn't they? I mean, we we were working in a medical centre where there, I think there was a group of social workers next door. Oh yeah, and 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 they would flush toilets at inappropriate times. They, yeah. they would do absolutely everything to, to try and disrupt yeah. what we were doing. Yeah. And so, <laughs> wow, in, that's you silly. Just incorporate it. You just say, yeah. well, yeah, well, thank you. Okay, we'll utilise that in some way. And, <laughs> yeah, we did. We were prepared yeah. for that because we were, yeah. some of our very early <laughs> hypnosis training that we did. Was under the, the the flight path yeah to an airport one of the major airports yeah. in the uk and there were jets mm. flying over all the time yeah. so we have to be able to to learn to screen that out and to help other people to screen it out and utilize distraction yeah and once that was embedded as a model a necessary condition for dissociation was to separate from that kind of thing well then somebody urinating loudly <laughs> you know uh, and farting and flushing and burping <laughs> that was not going to put us off <laughs> When you're the universe really, prepared you for that stuff ahead of time. Huh? 250 <laughs> decibels of noise over the yeah. top of the building you're in. You, 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 yeah, nah, that you wasn't try harder than that. Yeah, a little bit yeah. harder than that. Yeah. All right. Well, that's great. That's uh, <laughs> great stuff. All right. Um, so I, I'll have to wrap up there, but I really appreciate <laughs> the talk. And on that note. Right? Oh, that note. Yes. <laughs> Yes, pull the old chain, yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thanks for talking with me. We really enjoyed uh, it. Thank, thank you so you. much. All right. It's been wonderful. Bye. And I'll get this to you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Bless Thank you. Speak to you.